Listen to the song of the great tit. It emits sounds in the range of 4.5 kHz to mob attackers such as owls. When individuals get mobbed in the animal kingdom, the prey becomes the aggressor and attacks the predator. This behavior is a special kind of predator-prey relationship. And exactly this is the topic of today, the relation between predator and prey. But first, I will give you a quick overview about my structure. I will go more into detail about the population of animals. Next I describe the predator more precise, followed by the prey. Then we look at the mathematical model, the lotka volterra equations and transfer it to reality. Lastly I will deal with the disruptive factors. In an ecosystem there are millions of different living things, started with plants over insects to mammals. Plants can be left aside, in this video I will take a closer look at the behavior of animals. In the animal kingdom there are many different relations like competition, commensalism, mutualism and parasitism. Parasitism could be seen as a subgroup of symbiosis or as a subgroup from a predator. The predator-prey relationships are its own kind of relationship. Before we take a closer look at it, I would like to briefly explain the dynamics of populations so that you can better understand the connections. A population are all individuals of a species that have the same gene pool and reproduce. The growth of a population depends on the death rate and the birth rate. If more animals are born than die, the population grows. There are two major reproductive strategies, the R selection and the K selection. The R strategists have a lot of offspring because then there is a higher chance for survival in fast changing environments. The K strategists produce a fewer offspring, but they are very caring about them. The reproduction strategies are not fixed rules, they must always be seen in relative terms depending on which species the comparison is made. In the population, not only the reproduction is important, it's also influenced by various factors. Some abiotic factors are the temperature, oxygen availability, light availability, such as toxins and pollutants. There are also biotic factors like food, predators, competitors and diseases often caused by parasites. All these influences on growth can be seen in the model at a certain point. At first the population grows slowly. Now the factors have almost no influence. Then it begins to grow exponentially until the environmental resistance flattens the curve and the carrying capacity is reached. To illustrate this model better, I unfortunately have to use the current corona situation. Although viruses are not living organisms, they are also affected by logistical growth. So first only a few people are infected, then the curve grows slowly. Then more and more people are infected, the growth becomes exponential. When the resources of the virus are running out, the graph rises linearly. In our case the environmental resistance increases until phase 5 is reached, a stop. This is the carrying capacity. Of course, the graph only works in theory. With corona exit restrictions and much more are used to ensure that growth is as slow as possible. In ecology, however, there are also influences in the population. The population can fluctuate, for example by natural hazards or other catastrophes, such as a disease or there is less prey. Then phase 6, the dying phase starts and everything starts all over again. Now we can keep an eye on the predator's behavior. Normally one species, the predator, hunts another species, the prey. But it also happens that adult animals eat young animals from the same species. This is called cannibalism. Most animals are both, predator and prey. For example a ladybird hunts aphids, but itself is eaten by various birds and therefore it's hunted. Another example are frogs that eat flies and they are eaten also by birds. If a prey is being hunted, it first tries to escape the predator's gaze by camouflage. If this is not successful, an escape attempt is made and if this also fails, the animal must just defend itself. However, the prey is not completely helplessly exposed to the predator. It has different strategies to defend and protect herself. Furthermore, it's assumed that the prey has a small advantage in this race because they are strategists and the predators are case strategists. Despite the advantage, the prey has to use the energy for searching food or avoiding enemies even if there is no predator in range. As a result, young animals grow more slowly under this influence. 
I took you on a trip to population ecology for a reason. The graph can only handle one species. In the predator-prey model, two species, predator and prey, are treated. The interaction between a predator population and a prey population is considered over a long period of time. Scavengers have no influence on the relationship because they only eat their meat and therefore they have no influence on population sizes. With specialized species, co-evolution and mutual adaption often occurs. For example, the prey wants to hear the attacker early on and therefore gets away more easily. The predator adapts himself in such a way that he moves more silently. Through the model of Lotka and Volterra it has been found out that there is always a dominant species, the predator, and a subdominant species, the prey. The model assumes that the predator feeds only on this type of prey and has limitless appetite. Furthermore, the prey itself should not have a lack of food. That's why the predator and prey are dependent on each other. The environmental factors mentioned above are also excluded. It's funny that the Austrian mathematician Alfred Lotka and the Italian mathematician Vito Volterra discovered and formulated the equations independently from each other in the 1920s. They are differential and integral equations which I would like to spare you. As a classic example a hare and a fox are usually used, which I am doing the same now. Let's start with the first rule, the rule of periodicity. As the name says, the graphs are periodic. That means that there's an almost even ups and downs in the populations. Furthermore, the periods are shifted in time. The prey always reaches its maximum before the predator. The foxes eat more rabbits than are born and the population decreases. With it, the food supply for the foxes also falls and they also become less. Therefore, the rabbits recover and reproduce again which leads to a reproduction of foxes and so on. The rule number two is the preservation of averages. The mean value can always remain constant since the extreme points do not really change because of periodicity. The average value of the prey is always higher than the value of the predator, otherwise all her rabbits would have been eaten at some point. The last rule says that the prey population recovers faster than the predator population because they reproduce faster. This is only the result if both populations are reduced by a catastrophe, for example. The rule is called disturbance of averages. If there is a fewer rabbits, there is less food for the foxes and the population remains small for a period of time. In addition, the higher reproduction rate makes a difference. Rabbits are R strategists and foxes are K strategists. Should only get one population decimated, the value of the other population increases, but it has no effect on the long-term average. That was a lot of theory. Before I show you the example of the animal world, I would like to simulate the scenario with computer programs to make the rule even more understandable. You can simulate your example with rabbits and fox with a computer code. If I press start, the code is running and shows up and downs in the two populations. A graph displays the values and you see they look like graphs in my example. The better known program for simulating predator-prey relations is Bator. It's the first program and for today it's a screensaver for displays. It simulates fish and sharks on a fictional planet with the same mechanics like our world. In the Bator program I use there's another simulation version. The variance data comes close to a real example. This real world example is taken from a 90 year field study by the Hudson based company from Canada. It shows the relation between lynx and snowshoe hares with a result of a period fluctuation of 9.6 years. Unfortunately, hunters falsify this example. Other well known relations are the great tit and the old mentioned at the beginning lions and gazelles, cat and mouse such as carnivore plants, the venus flytraps and flies. As beautiful as the model is, unfortunately it's not really transferable to the real life, as you saw in the examples graph. In reality there are many more environmental factors that affect predator and prey. For instance, the predator eat more than one type of prey and eat animals that are not usually on the menu. In addition, there is social stress. When there are too many animals live on an area, this stress leads to more aggressive behavior. Another factor that does not appear in this model is the human itself. We also have the influence on every single habitat and ecosystem, not only with hunting, but more on that later. We humans also eat meat. 
apart from vegetarians and vegans, but in general, we do. That's why the predator-prey model could and can be transferred to us. The simplest version would be the cannibalism mentioned earlier, we all have heard about it. In our time, the predator-prey relation is not so primitive anymore. You can transfer the model to various factors. For example, if an entrepreneur sells a product but pays dumping wages, he should not be surprised if less is sold. The arms race in the Cold War can also be seen through the model. With every upgrade, they try to be superior to the opponent, so it's a form of co-evolution. The armistice can be seen as a reduction and therefore represent the devaluation. One last example for this video is piracy, which unfortunately still takes place today. The pirate is the predator and the cargo ship is the prey. If pirates attack too many ships, the freighter will take a different route and it's not longer worth it for the pirates, so both nearly die out in one area until the cargo ships there again. Invasive species are also a disturbance of the natural predator and prey relationship. In an unaffected ecosystem, the predator cannot make its prey extinct. However, if non-system species are introduced. This was the case when the brown tree snake was brought from Australia to Guam. Being a stranger, the predator has an easy way to get its prey, because the prey was defenseless and unprepared, which finally caused the extinction of nearly every bird on this island. The example of the snake is caused by humans, like many others. But it can happen that a species invades a foreign ecosystem without the help of humans. If I tell you that we humans interfere in intact and independent ecosystems and thereby in predator-prey relations, you will probably think directly of hunting. Some argue that with hunting they have to compensate the disappearance of natural predators like wolves, but there is no full agreement. Apart from hunting, human activities such as lowering the groundwater levels, polluting the air and ground, for instance with plastic waste, and of course the climate change, influence the natural ecosystems and the relationship between predator and prey. By changing the habitat, the human makes it easier for the predator to catch their prey. To compensate this, there is the so-called predator management, according to the NABU, the Natural Biodiversity Conversation Union from Germany. The predator management should be used to protect endangered species even with hunting methods. This video was about the predator-prey relationship. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did so, please leave a comment with feedback and a like. Thank you for watching. See ya!